Coming up on this episode, author Rachel Reed joins us to talk about the latest book in her Game Changers Hockey Romance series. Welcome to episode 329 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Will, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hello, Rainbow Romance readers. It is wonderful to have you back for another episode of the podcast. We've got lots of hockey to talk about in this episode, and you've got some exciting news about a certain YA hero. I do, and it even connects to our hockey theme. Three of the four of my Codename Winger audiobooks are finally everywhere wide. Tracker Hacker, Schooled, and Audio Assault have all made their way into Audible. They're also available from all of the other audiobook outlets. I am so thrilled with the way these books have turned out in audio format. Now, we talked to Kurt Graves, who is the narrator for these books, back at episode 315 about his work on this series. And if you didn't catch that, you should definitely go back and give it a listen because it was a wonderful conversation with Kurt. And at the end of that episode, you can actually hear the prologue and the first chapter from Tracker Hacker to get a little sample of what those books are like. When we recorded that episode, he had done the first two books and I gush a little bit in that episode with him about his work. I absolutely adore how he took Theo on such a journey as he did these books. You can hear... Theo mature through Kurt's voice across the four books. Even though they're my stories, frankly, Kurt made me cry more than once in these books because he just hits the emotional tones so very well. So I'm thrilled that these are starting to be available everywhere. You can also pick them up on my website, direct from me for a cheaper price as well. And you can do that at jeffadamswrites.com. Simply click the shop button and you'll be able to see all the books and audiobooks that are available, and those will all be delivered to you via Book Funnel. So I hope you'll check out these books now that they're available wherever you want to pick up an audiobook, and give a listen to Kurt's wonderful work on this series. Before we get into our conversation with Rachel, I actually want to review a couple of the books from the Game Changers series. Now, it doesn't seem possible that you have to go back to episode 169, which happens to be the final episode of 2018, to find my review of Rachel Reed's Game Changer, which I absolutely adored. And as I prepared to talk with Rachel for this week's episode, I came back to the series and read the second book, which is Heated Rivalry. And I absolutely kick myself for not reading it sooner. This enemies to lovers, years long, slow burn romance is absolutely incredible and has vaulted onto the list of my all time favorite hockey romance books. Shane Hollander and Ilya Rosanoff are two of hockey's best players, and the rivalry between them has long roots, going back to when they squared off in a game when they were still teenagers before the NHL draft brought them both into the big leagues. The NHL was happy to continue to stoke the fire of the rivalry too, as were the guys. They wanted to win, they wanted to score the most goals, they wanted the awards. They pushed each other to new heights in their career. What they hadn't expected is to end up in any kind of off-ice relationship. Even a friendship didn't seem possible for these two. Yet, they end up in a situation where they can't help hooking up whenever they're in the same city. For Shane, this is new territory. He's only been with women before, but he's suspected he might be bi or maybe gay. For Ilya, he's definitely bi. But the more he's with Shane, the less satisfied he is with anyone else. Aside from being equally competitive... Shane and Ilya are complete opposites, antagonizing each other at every turn. Shane is nice, always nice, but still finds a way with that niceness to push Ilya's buttons. Ilya is happy to rock the boat and get under people's skin, and Shane doesn't understand that. And boy, if there was ever an instance of opposites attract, it's these two. Rachel does an incredible job of getting these two together, and for each meetup, forcing the two to realize more and more what they mean to each other, while at the same time setting up the difficulties of if and how they might come out and what that could mean. Even though the NHL has an out player with Scott Hunter, who does make appearances in this book. Alongside their growing relationship, Shane and Ilya grapple with their rising success and status in the league and how that spills into their personal lives. Rest assured, at each turn, they're measuring themselves against the other, while also balancing how their success affects other friends, family, and relationships. And in that area, they also could not be more opposite either, because Shane has a wonderful family, 
whereas for Ilya, he is mostly looked at as a bank by his family. In this story told over multiple years, and by my count, it was seven or maybe eight, Rachel keeps the story moving, never letting it feel like it's taking too long. And while there is a lot of sex, since these two are usually together when hooking up, each one of those hookups are very distinct and drive the emotional plot forward. There are some really standout moments for me too, including when Ilya says, I love you, without actually saying, I love you. And if you've read the book, you know exactly the scene I'm talking about, and if you haven't, you definitely will understand it when you read it. One of my other favorite moments happens to be one that Rachel's going to talk about because it's one of her favorite moments, and I'm going to let her tell you about that one in the interview in a few minutes. Shane and Ilya absolutely crackle on the page, and I'm not sure that I've ever loved Enemies to Lovers so much. It was fun to see how even when they were truly falling for each other, that there was still antagonism there, even as it kind of softened a little bit into just good-natured barbs. Yes, there are some moments that make you hold your breath on if they can keep their secrets until the right time, and in one particularly oops moment, they kind of don't. <laughs> the book ends as a happy for now, but it's a great happy for now. Or at least it was for me, because I loved what Shane and Ilya had in mind for their future. And speaking of future, let's jump forward to the brand new book in this series with Role Model, which is book five. It only took the opening chapters for me to be absolutely in love with hockey player Troy, and social media manager Harris. I will say that I have not read books three and four in this series, so I don't have the history that some readers will have with Troy, so I immediately cheered for what he did just before this book started. Troy has landed in Ottawa to play for the Centaurs, which, by the way, I think is a really kick-ass hockey name, <laughs> totally separate from anything else going on. He got traded from Toronto because he called out Dallas Kent, Toronto star player and Troy's former best friend, because he believes the anonymous complaints that have come out accusing Dallas of sexual harassment. On top of that, just before that incident with Dallas, Troy got dumped by his secret boyfriend of two years. Of course, Troy can't discuss his love life because he can't face coming out. And since his reputation has been one of a not nice guy, his new Ottawa teammates aren't exactly excited by his arrival. At least the team captain, Ilya Rosanoff, is friendly and welcomes him. And yes, I may have squeed a bit to find Ilya in here as the captain, because it's a chance to see what was going on with him. Social media manager Harris has to be welcoming to the new guy. In fact, Harris is pretty much welcoming and friendly to everyone. His bubbly demeanor came right off the page as a ray of sunshine, and I absolutely love him. He's unapologetically exactly who he is. Out, proud, happy, determined to live his life to the fullest. Everyone should be as happy in life and in their job as he is. Harris is thrilled that Troy is on the team, not only because he's had a crush on him for a very long time, but also for the stand he took in support of the women who'd accuse Kent. As much as Troy is inside his head as he arrives in Ottawa and his first day with the team, he is a bit smitten with Harris. Not only is Harris attractive, although not exactly Troy's regular type, He's also thrilled to find an openly gay man embraced and befriended by this team. As much as Troy may try to keep himself to himself, keep his head down, and play good hockey, he can't ignore Harris and the efforts he makes to be kind and friendly. Initially, it's about showing Troy around Ottawa, but the more time they spend together, whether it's doing work for the team or hanging out, Troy can't help but fall more in like, and eventually a lot more, with Harris. These two end up in such a super cute give and take with each other, that it gave me all the feels multiple times. The redemption arc for Troy is very strong in this book. While he has a certain rep in the league, he's doing everything he can to change. He doesn't want to be thought of as anything like Dallas Kent, and he's discussing with himself that he behaved the way that he did in an effort to be liked and to fit in. His growth through the story is so wonderful, and adds a great dimension alongside the romance. Troy's got good people around him in Ottawa, and he realizes that more and more through the story. Rachel did such a great job of balancing these two facets of the story, and I really can't speak highly enough of it. And I'd be remiss not to spend a moment on Ilya. It's wonderful to see how he's evolved since the end of Heated Rivalry, including showing more of his big heart. There are moments with him and a puppy who becomes the team's unofficial mascot that are crazy cute. There's also a moment where he and Shane meet up on the ice, which is loaded with some great chemistry that we get to view through Troy's eyes. There are other moments in the book featuring Ilya that resonated so much with me having read the previous book. 
You'll hear shortly from Rachel about what's coming up next for Shane and Ilya, and I am so psyched for that. Meanwhile, back here with Role Model, I love the story that Rachel told. It's a great romance for Troy and Harris, and it's an incredible story of Troy finding himself and becoming a much better version of himself as he realizes fully how terrible his past has been and how good his future can be. I highly recommend both Heated Rivalry and Role Model. And I know that sooner than later, I'm going to be going back to pick up books three and four in the series so that I can read these other stories. I have so very much become a huge fan of Rachel's. So let's get to that conversation with Rachel. She talks with us about what got her started writing the Game Changer series, her longstanding love of the game, and her fascination with the players. We also talk about book six, plus we even get a little sneak peek of what might come after that. Rachel, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. I am super excited to be here. This is a huge honor. (laughs) I'm totally thrilled to have you here to talk about Game Changers. I enjoyed the books when I started reading them in 2018, and you've just released the fifth book with Role Model. Before we get into the latest, take us back and tell us about the series and what got it started for you. It's sort of like a write what you know thing because I just had all this useless hockey knowledge in my head and I wanted to use it for something. I've just had like a lifelong love of hockey, but more than that, like a lifelong fascination with hockey players, just the weird way that they are. But yeah, hockey is also a super problematic thing to like, especially men's NHL hockey. So I think my ideas kind of came together as my own way of dealing with with my love of hockey in a way that makes it a little bit more palatable for myself. So I'm kind of trying to create a more optimistic, nicer version of the NHL for myself with player led change, which I think actually just last week, the first contracted NHL player came out as gay, which is amazing. That still didn't seem anything close to that was going to happen when I wrote game changer, but I guess it was just, I don't know, a super happy idea of what it might be like if a really big star came out. That was the starting idea for me. Just what would be my ideal Mm -hmm. (laughs) version of that happening? And it's interesting that it's only taken this long for hockey, too. That has just happened in this month that we're recording in July. Even though the You Can Play project started in hockey and has been around for a little more than a decade now. Yeah. And, you know, I think all the teams have pride nights now. I think so, and, yeah. You know, I've seen NHL players say that the culture is so toxic, even from a very young age, that it would drive a lot of queer kids out <laughs> before they even got to the level where scouts might be looking at them. That's definitely a big part of the problem. And hopefully that it will finally start to pivot now. Yeah, I hope so. I'm, I'm really excited that Luke Prokop, as his name came out, is really exciting it's brave it's been really well received hopefully there will be player-led change the young players will do it now i know you live in canada so hockey runs in the blood there but what pulled you into the sport i always had this fascination with hockey players they're super conditioned to be hockey players and i'm not trying to generalize here because i'm sure some of them are a little bit different but i've been following it my whole life NHL players are super conservative. I don't mean like politically necessarily, although a lot of them probably are, but they conform in a way where they're not really comfortable talking about anything that's not hockey. And it's like they're conditioned like soldiers. They're all very similar interests. (laughs) And when they are interviewed, they all basically say the same things and they sound very much the same. I always was aware of that. And there was something that kind of interested me in why the culture is that way. You don't even really see that with other sports. There's a lot more individualism in other sports. I enjoyed the sport for what it was in the same way that so many Canadians love it and just love cheering for a team and to complain about bad calls or whatever. But I also had this fascination with the culture around it and the way the hockey players behave and talk. From probably the time I was a teenager, I got really into that. I think I was writing my first hockey fiction when I was 12 or 13, taking stabs at writing novels about hockey players. Because that's no, cool. I just, it just really interests me. <laughs> Early storytelling in terms of hockey. I like that. Tell us a little bit about Role Model and Troy and social media manager Harris. 
Yeah, so Troy's a really minor character that first appeared in Tough Guy, the third book, as kind of one of two players on the team that were giving the main character of that one, Ryan Price, a hard time. So he's kind of a bad guy, but he's not really on the page enough to really be firmly established as a bad guy. He just seems not great. He has another small appearance in Common Goal, and now he has his own book. So the book kind of starts with him just before the book begins, a bunch of stuff happens. So this does not actually happen on the page. He's best friends with this guy, Dallas Kent on the Toronto team, who is the villain in the books. He's a just a horrible person. He is not a redeemable character. People have asked if he's getting his own book. No, he is terrible. <laughs> kind of two things happen that kind of ruin Troy's life. And one is that a bunch of women anonymously post detailed accounts of being sexually assaulted by Dallas online. And Troy believes that they're all true, but he seems to be the only one who does. And then also Troy has been secretly dating a guy for two years. Troy's very deeply in the closet, but has been in the secret relationship for two years with an actor in Vancouver who dumps him the same week that he finds out all this stuff about his best friend. So these two things happen at once. It causes him to kind of snap at practice and he calls it his friend very loudly and it's captured on video and it goes viral. So Troy gets traded to Ottawa and that's where the book begins. So Troy's basically rock bottom, <laughs> but no one can know about it. No one knows about the boyfriend part, about how he's dealing with this kind of heartbreak. And then mostly people just think he's maybe a slightly less bad version of his friend. So they're not really super welcoming. So yeah, that's where he is. He's just pretty miserable. He's generally a pretty glum guy anyway. He doesn't smile much. But Harris is the team's social media manager in Ottawa, and he is a polar opposite. He is all sunshine. He's openly gay. He's very confident, very loud, very chatty. And he's pretty determined to make Troy smile. That's what the book's about. It's kind of just a redemption arc. Grumpy sunshine trope. Those are always fun. Those characters who are just determined to get a smile out of somebody. It's, come on, you can do yeah. it. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, only once in the series so far have you paired hockey player with hockey player. And otherwise, you've got the social media guy with the new book, and you've had musicians and smoothie makers and grad students. How do you decide what profession makes for the one to pair with the hockey player? Yeah, I think mostly I, I don't do two hockey players too often because I just want to write about at least half the book about something that's not hockey. But it would have been way easier to just have two teammates because they'd be together all the time. Because the challenge with hockey romance is that the NHL player is always going to be away or busy. But if they're teammates, they'd be together. <laughs> so that would be easier. I think the first one just followed kind of, it was a coffee shop romance, except it was a smoothie shop. And I just kind of liked the idea of Scott Hunter, the hockey player, having a lucky smoothie that he kept going for. Really highlighting that whole superstition thing that most hockey players, if not all hockey yeah. players, have to an extreme. <laughs> yeah, because I really wanted it to be this kind of just a super wealthy celebrity guy and then just a guy working a minimum wage job, but I had to figure out a reason why their lives would come together. And then for a tough guy, I just really wanted the complete opposite of Ryan, who is a hockey enforcer. And so I came up with this musician character. And I liked the idea of him being somebody that Ryan had met as a teenager when he billeted with his family playing junior hockey. And that, yeah, that Fabian, the, the other guy, just didn't fit in with his hockey-loving family at all and didn't care about hockey at all, but was a super talented musician, very artistic. And I liked that he was kind of on his own path to stardom in that book. I kind of wanted one character to be on the way out of his hockey career while the other one's music career is taking off. So I think that's why, yeah, I chose an artistic profession for him. And then Harris being social media, that's the closest I've gotten to a teammate. I just wanted somebody who could be around all the time. <laughs> so I thought that would be a good way to do it. Given your long history with hockey, is there anything in these books that relate to hockey that you actually have to research at this point? Or is it just all <laughs> in your head? 
there's some things I wish I could just talk to an NHL player just to ask some really basic questions about how do you get to the plane or how, what's the team breakfast situation like? <laughs> like? I do try to find out little details to get it as realistic as possible, but usually that means kind of doing deep dives into videos that maybe <laughs> were posted a long time ago. Maybe a player has something on their own Instagram or the social media person did. I remember for a tough guy, I had to research what the what a penalty box assistant actually does because I wanted to be clear about that. And then I thought that would be an amazing job. I wish I was a penalty box assistant. <laughs> you basically just get to watch a hockey game. Um, I always worry about them if yeah. somebody comes in just too raging mad and there's this big defenseman coming after you and yeah. you're the only other person in that really tiny little box. <laughs> Yeah, I think most of what I research is really tiny details that no one's going to care about anyway, but I just want them to be right. I still get people, hockey fanatics, who are like, this is wrong. <laughs> I tried. Or sometimes I change things because like it's too boring or confusing to explain. Yeah, you've like got to make just... it good for everybody, uh, the people who are not hockey enthusiasts, too. To like... Yeah, like Scott, like I give some of the players roommates, even if, they're at a level where they probably wouldn't have roommates just because it, it's better for the story <laughs> or like for the all-star game. I'm not going to explain that it's supposed to be like four and four, whatever it is instead of five right. five, who cares. <laughs> and some of those things, they change the format so often. You, who knows oh, what know. it's going to be at any given the moment. The all-star game, you can just make it up. Yeah. <laughs> now you're getting ready for your first sequel as you come back to Shane and Ilya from He Did Rivalry. Did you always have that in mind? Because the book, as you've noted on your blog, doesn't end with an explicit HEA and that it's more of a happy for now, just given where that book ended. Yeah, I always hoped I'd get to write the sequel. I tried to write the first one in a way that if it never happened, it might be satisfying enough. And I also knew there were more books in the series, so I could at least check in with those guys and give readers a hint of what's going on after and then I also thought I could write short stories, little epilogue short stories or stories set in the future. But I, I did hope that I could write a sequel. But it is awkward to have a sequel in the series of standalones. So what I tried to do is make all of the books sort of spiritual sequels to each other. So Common Goal is kind of a sequel to Game Changer. It's set in the same city, same team. Role Model is a sequel to Tough Guy. And then this will be the sequel to Heated Rivalry, but it's a full-on sequel. <laughs> same couple, same everything. So I'm really glad I'm getting the chance to, to write it. It's really satisfying to be able to give them a much bigger happy ending. I have to imagine it might be kind of fun to be back with them because they're such an antagonistic pair against each other. Even where they leave off at the end of that book, they're still scraping against each other a little bit because it's their thing yeah it's definitely a big part of their relationship even now into the future they're definitely still very competitive antagonistic and they're still sneaking around so those elements from the first book are still there that's what people liked about them in the first one that still exists but yeah i find the challenge with a contemporary romance sequel with the same couple is how do you keep that relationship interesting? Because they are together and they're very much in love. There has to be these kind of external conflicts. So there's a bit of that and they still have to figure out how to have their relationship public. They have to come out and people need to deal with it. So that's what this cool about mostly. Can't wait. Because I, I became such a Shane and Ilya fan. Enemies to lovers is a hit or miss with me, but these two, I don't know. It was just so perfect and following it over so many years because you really had the extended timeline in that book with seven, eight years in there that just kept flying by because they only get to meet up when they're in the same town. Yeah, it's sort of a story told through sex scenes. I honestly wasn't sure how that book would be received. I didn't even think the publisher would take it. I just thought the fact that it is largely sex scenes <laughs> and it doesn't have a, a definite happy ending it doesn't have a black moment it doesn't have a lot of things but i think i kind of just wrote it for me <laughs> but it's definitely the most popular book of the series so it all worked out <laughs> <laughs> like, i'm really glad because i really enjoy writing those characters looking across the five books you've got out there now 
in the series. Do you have a favorite moment that you've written in amongst the five that it's this scene right here is one that I'm super proud of or something like that? Yeah, the one that comes to mind first is probably when in heated rivalry, not to spoil too much, but there's a scene where he is going through something and, and Shane calls him. And it's kind of the first time they've talked on the phone. And Ilya's really upset, but also kind of too tired and uh, emotional to put his thoughts into English words. So Shane just tells him to say everything in Russian. Mm -hmm. And he'll just listen, even though he doesn't understand. And I don't know. I really like that scene personally. I think it was a nice moment that elevated their relationship in a way that was kind of weird and specific to them. Weird, but yet absolutely drew them closer together because neither one of them had to do that. And it was so sweet. Yeah, it was one of those moments that made me go, oh, <laughs> among <laughs> yeah, many in that like, book. I'm not a super emotional person. So if I can write something that, that makes me feel something, that's a memorable scene for me. <laughs> Looking beyond book six, do you envision more? in Game Changers to keep it going? I don't know. I'm kind of writing this one with this being the final book. It makes sense to me. But there are a few scattered characters that kind of interest me that could have books, but I'd kind of really like to take a break from hockey romance after this one, just because hockey's really bumming me out lately. And I just kind of like to write about really just anything else maybe not millionaires and not fit people just to switch it up so i think i'm not saying definitely no i'd like to take a break my contract still has one more book for karina after the long game but it can be anything i want it doesn't have to be another game changers book so i might try to do something else and then i might come back to it or i might start a spin-off series or something or a whole new hockey romance I was going to ask, because it's all been hockey so far yeah. that we've seen with with Rachel Reed. And so it was going to be interesting to see if you were going to maybe start to mix it up a little bit with something else. So I'm intrigued to see what now what you do with that last book to Karina. Is it going to be hockey or will it be? Who knows? <laughs> Most of the ideas I have are not hockey. Okay. Right to now, see what I'd comes say probably that. not. So one of the things I've seen a lot with the, the current Game Changer books is there's a playlist for every one of them. Where do the playlists come from? And do you have a playlist in mind as you sit down to write? Or does it kind of manifest itself as you're writing? It's kind of both. It's usually the first step in, in starting a new book for me is I make the playlist. It changes a lot as I'm writing the book. This is the only way I'm Quentin Tarantino. I make the playlist first. And then I start to write. I get inspired by music and I... I think it's fun, like a little playlist, and I have to listen to it a lot when I'm writing. Not while I'm actually writing, like maybe in the car or when I'm walking around or something, I'll listen to that playlist just to think. Usually if I'm writing, I have to listen to classical music or something. And then when the book is done, I like to share the playlist just in case people want to have the official soundtrack. <laughs> It was interesting to see the playlists for the books that I read. I'm like, well, that's an interesting song to have in that <laughs> book. All over the place. <laughs> a little bit, but I like the eclectic. All the playlists that I've ever done are wildly eclectic. So it was kind of fun to see. And then you're, I get to thinking about how does that song connect and how does that song connect? So it's kind of fun to try to match I things up to like, the emotions and such. I have half a blog post written where I was explaining the heated rivalry playlist song by song. And then I just got bored of writing. <laughs> like, maybe I should go back and try to finish that just to give people an idea of why the playlist is so all over the place. So let's talk about your origin story and how you got started writing. You mentioned that you've got hockey fiction that goes back to when you were 12. When did you become a storyteller? I don't know. When I was a kid in the 80s, I was obsessed with this Canadian author named Gordon Corman, who's a big deal up here, like children's author mainly. But he published his first book when he was 14, and it was a huge hit. He wrote it as a school project, and it was a monster hit here in, in Canada. It was a novel. And then he ended up publishing five books before he graduated from high school. 
And he's still a big name here. He's written something like 90 books at this point. But I was really obsessed with him as a goal. Like I was like, oh, maybe I'll publish a book when I'm 14. I did not, but it definitely was like, I'm going to do it. But anyway, I wrote a lot as a kid, but just largely unfinished things or Ninja Turtles fan fiction or whatever. But definitely a lot of hockey related stuff too. And then when I was older, I discovered fan fiction, internet fan fiction. I didn't write a lot of it, but I read a lot of it, but I wrote a little bit of it. So I dabbled a bit in that. Just every few years, something would come along that would get me writing again, but I never really thought I'd write a whole book. What changed that to get you to start a book, finish a book and take the leap even to submit a book? I was working on Game Changer for a while. And then there were more LGBTQ romances happening, but I just wasn't sure if there was a big demand from publishers for them or anything, or if it'd be something I could self-publish or how it would work. I just didn't, I didn't know much about publishing. I still don't know much about publishing, but yeah. So I guess when I finished it, people told me I should try to publish it. And so I was okay. I really wasn't sure how to go about doing that. Somebody told me about Karina. So that was one of the places I submitted. But yeah, I was clueless. Like, But I was just like, I mean, I, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Ended up working out. I got revise and resubmit, which my tip is revise and resubmit if you get that. Because sure. it'll work. <laughs> what led you down the path of writing romance and, and romance with LGBTQ characters? For me, the romance plot line in anything has always been my favorite thing. So whether it's a movie or a TV show or comic books or video games or anything, I'm like, the, the romance storyline is what hooks me. Obviously, I was, why not read things that are entirely romance storylines? <laughs> and why not write those things? That's what got me into romance. And then I think even when I was really young, I was just really excited whenever there was anything that even hinted at any LGBTQ romance on a show or movie or anything at all. Because there was not a lot of it when I was like, Growing up in the 80s and 90s, there's not really all that much of it now, but it was even just a heated glance or something would just be so exciting to me just to see that, I don't know, that possibility of queer romance (laughs) in a story. So I think, I don't know, that's maybe why I've always kind of been drawn to it, but I like all romance. But yeah, this particular story idea I had for the Game Changer series that just happened to be about men in love with each other i definitely read a lot of lgbtq romance probably more than any anything else who are some of the authors who inspire the kinds of stories you tell my big three favorite authors are cat sebastian alexis hall and kj charles which i think probably a lot of people (laughs) would say (laughs) would name those three but there's really good reason for it. I look at their books and I'm like, there's not a wasted sentence, you know, like that's the goal. I feel that's kind of this benchmark I want to hit. (laughs) just really well-crafted stories. I also, I really love Charlie O'Hara's The Big Bad Wolf series for Karina. And I don't know, I just really like anyone who's funny (laughs) and creates interesting, sexy characters. Allison Temple, Ali Theron, Jen Burke. I like Layla Rain a lot. Adriana Herrera, Sam Burns, and W.M. Fox. They write together sometimes and they write separately as well. I like both of them. Tanya Chris. I don't know. Lots of people. I do humor a lot. That usually stands out to me. And what do you think the trademarks of one of your stories are that makes a Rachel Reed story a Rachel Reed story? Exhibitionist masturbation. (laughs) (laughs) The most interesting answer we've ever had when we've asked that question. (laughs) It might be one thing. I hope humor. I hope that my love of writing dialogue comes through. And also, I don't know, men being kind of stupid. Uh, You listed off a whole bunch of authors there, but is there a particular book that you've read recently that you would actually recommend to our readers to pick up? Yeah, I I really loved Alexis Hall's new one, Rosalind Palmer Takes the Cake. I just thought it was so funny and the love interest is adorable. And I think it's fantastic bisexual rep. It's a male-female romance, but it's very queer. And I really love that. It's a love triangle, but it's a woman in who both of the love interests are men. But it's fantastic. It's just so much fun. And uh, it's the first of a new series. I'm looking forward to more of that. And uh, Kat Sebastian's uh, new one, The Queer Principles of Kit Webb, is also basically perfect. 
But I thought Sally Malcolm's Kingsman is really good. That one's self-published, so I'll give that a shout out because it's not it doesn't get the marketing push that the others do do. But that's a really great gripping historical romance about like two colonial American ex-lovers who are separated and reunite in England. One's an exiled traitor and the other's a spy. And it's really good. Ooh, I haven't heard of that one. The other two are yep. very high on my list, but now you've given me a third to go after too. So we've talked a little bit about what might be coming after that heated rivalry sequel. Anything in particular more you want to share about what might be in the future? I'm hoping to take a bit of a break after this one because we've been going pretty hard the last few years. But yeah, I'm hoping to do some books set in Nova Scotia where I live because I think it would be a really great setting for a romance series, maybe. So that's one thing I'm thinking about. But yeah, mostly I'm just hoping that, you know, that I'll get the long game done and everybody will be very happy with it. Because <laughs> I know a lot of people have been sending me their requests for it, which is really nice, but I don't know if they're all going to get in to my best. I can only I, I imagine what be... people might be asking for to get jammed into this book. <laughs> I mean, most of it's reasonable, some of it's not, but I'm definitely considering everyone's suggestions. Because <laughs> really, this book is for the fans of the first one. There's no other reason for it to exist. I want it to be satisfying for everyone who liked the first book. And for me, I'm definitely, I want it to be good. I want it to be how I want it to be. So yeah, but I also would get to come out on time looking forward to it sometime in 2022 <laughs> i think tentatively spring but i don't know what's the best way for folks to keep up with you online so they can know when this book comes out future books probably twitter which is aka rachel reed i tell myself every day i'm gonna leave twitter and i never do it so you may as well find me on there i'm on instagram too under rachel reed writes all one word those are the two places. I am not very online. I do not have a Facebook group. I don't have a mailing list. Yeah, I'm just not very online. <laughs> so you can find me though. those two places. I'm probably well, we'll ranting about hockey on Twitter. <laughs> it's a good thing to rant about. <laughs> yeah. So we'll link up to those social media places. We'll link up to all the books and authors that we talked about. Rachel, it's been so wonderful talking to you. Best of luck with the release of Role Model and looking forward to seeing what comes next in the series. Thank you. This episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the conversation for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at biggayfictionpodcast.com. And don't forget, the show notes page also has links to everything that we've discussed in this episode. On the show notes page, you'll also find links to audiobooks that are available from Libro.fm. Rachel's entire Game Changer series, and for that matter, my Codename Winger series, are all available on Libro.fm. The place that when you buy an audiobook, you're actually supporting a local bookstore of your choice, which of course is such a wonderful thing to do. Listeners to the Big Gay Fiction podcast can pick up a two-month audiobook membership for the price of one. To get more details on that offer and take advantage of it, simply go to biggayfictionpodcast.com slash Libro.fm. That's L-I-B-R-O-F-M. And thanks again to Rachel for joining us. It was so wonderful talking with someone who is as into the game as she is. I am definitely looking forward to her future books. All right. I think that'll do it for now. Coming up next on Monday in episode 330, we'll have a preview of some of the books that are coming out in the month of September. It is another jam-packed month of books, so you're not going to want to miss this to start adding to your TBR for fall. On behalf of Jeff and myself, we want to thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you'll join us again soon for more discussions about the kind of stories that we all love, the big gay fiction kind. Until then, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Production assistance by Tyson Greenan. Original theme music by Daryl Banner. 